So a lot of people were interested in tax properties, mainly because they're cheaper properties that you can buy. You don't have to necessarily, if the house is worth 50,000, you don't have to pay 50,000 for the house. And if the house is worth 200,000, you don't have to pay $200,000 for a house. So some investors get some real deals when it comes to tax properties, but you just gotta make sure you do your homework when it comes to tax properties. We're gonna talk about how to buy tax properties and teach you about it. We're mainly gonna focus on the Alabama area, um, but we'll talk about Florida and Georgia markets as well. But our expertise is more in the Alabama area. So that's what we're gonna give you advice on. A tax property is a house where the owners have neglected to pay their property taxes for a certain amount of years. Each state has different laws on how long an owner can go without paying. Um, and then investors pay those tax properties when owners go delinquent on them. Yeah. What is a tax certificate? A tax certificate is a lien against the property for unpaid real estate taxes. Back taxes are considered to be in certificate stage for three years in Alabama. Generally, the investor that pays back pays the back taxes does not take possession of the property when it's in certificate stage. Um, there's usually an auction that happens once a year and you can buy tax certificates there or you can pay for it online. Um, tax deeds is when you can take possession of the property. After three years of not paying back taxes, you can pay the back taxes and you get the deed to the property. And that gives you the right to possession to the property. So there's a big difference between a tax certificate and the tax deed. Absolutely. There's several ways that you can gather a list when it comes to um, back taxes. You can actually get the paper copy where you can go to your tax assessor's office and pick up the physical copy, which is pretty a pretty get, a pretty big stack of papers um, with everyone who has dealing with taxes. Or you can pay for the CD, which usually comes in an Excel format, which is a lot easier to decipher and use. There are different softwares that you can use um, to break down that CD because there's so many tax properties on that CD just to maneuver and get to the ones that you basically want. Fortress. Fortress is the people who basically introduce buying tax properties to us. They went to a training and they showed us all type of things about tax properties. And most of the stuff they showed us, we're showing you today. The main thing that Fortress, they focus on tax property and they have a system around buying tax properties. They have different products that you can use, different softwares that you can use, different lists that you can buy. They're basically a one-shop stop when it comes to taxes. That's correct. Um, the system that Fortress has for breaking down tax property is called their research assistant. They have other um, programs, but that's mainly the program that will help you as far as sorting out the tax properties. How do we use Fortress? We use Fortress to break down the CD, like I said, and to find all the properties that are in tax deed status. We don't want them that's in certificate status. At least we don't want them in certificate status. We want them in tax deed status so that we can take possession of the property. If someone's living in the property, you can still take possession. You would just have to evict them and go that route um, as far as getting someone out of the property. But Fortress helps determine if the taxes have been paid since the last time the CD was updated. Um, in Jefferson County, in Pacific, they um, only update the tax CD once a year. So an owner could have paid and you wouldn't know it'll show delinquent on the tax CD, but it's not the most accurate. That's where Fortress comes in. It tells you, hey, this one's been paid. So you don't have to guess. Go ahead. Um, targeting properties. 
with the Fortress software, it's, it's really amazing what the software do. Um, once you take the CD that we purchased from the county the courthouse, we implement that into the software. And the software spit back to us all type of information. And it's up to you to pick out what information is important to you to start segmenting your market to find out what property taxes you want. The first, the most sought after properties are non owner occupants. Because if a person isn't living in a property, that means it's more of an investment property. And that means they probably had tenants, which means it's probably vacant right now. So you want to try and find non owner occupants. If they're out of state, they're highly motivated because the property is vacant and they don't know what's going on with the property. Zip codes and price points. The software is basically Excel, so it'll allow you to break down the properties by zip codes and by price points and a combination of both. Make sure that the properties are not lots. Um, it's unless a, you want a lot. Unless that's what you want. For us, we didn't want lots. We wanted properties, vacant properties, out-of-state owners that it was easy to get into, easy to fix up, easy to rent. That was our strategy. It's multiple strategies that you can use with tax properties, but we're telling you our strategy. Right. All right, so how we segment the market. As Sonia said, we segment by zip codes. We use a map. Um, you can use Google Maps or we like to use Enroute, which is on Apple phones. I'm not sure if it's on Androids, but Enroute, what it does is you can put all the addresses in. I think you can put up to 25. 25 for the paid version. For the paid version, correct. That's key. Um, you can put up to 25 and then it'll sort what's the fastest route. So you'll pick your starting point and your ending point, wherever you want to be for starting and ending. And it'll tell you what's the quickest routes to go visit those properties so that you would, that way you can make sure that they're not lots, unless it's what you want. And you can make sure what kind of condition they're in and if someone's living in it. All right. Just the last thing, the list is going to give you a lot of information. So what we did, well, me slash I, I took the list and I segmented it by zip code. And every day I would drive to see 50 to 100 houses. But I wasn't driving like here, there, here, there. It was only the properties in certain zip codes. And I had a strategy from Google Maps and Enroute to get it done the quickest. That was my job, Enroutes and Google maps so that he can have a map to go visit the properties. Um, so pick your most desirable zip codes so that you can view those first. And when Tony is saying that he visit 50 properties a day, sometimes there are six properties on one street that was delinquent. So you ride by really quick those properties. Driving for dollars. Driving for dollars is when you're driving to find good opportunities, good money-making opportunities when it comes to real estate. So you'll hear people say driving for dollars. They're looking for um, for sale by owners. They're looking for vacant houses. They're just looking for any opportunity to make some money. So driving for dollars is what that means. The system. Um, what I did I basically basically created a grading system for the property because you're going to see so many properties, it's going to be hard to remember each property. And what I did was I created my own personal grading system. And you can create your own system, but this is just work, what worked for me. Um, I basically had one to five for us. For us. Okay, All right, thank you. I had basically in the area, it was a rating of one to five. In the property, it was a rating of one to five. And I'm gonna go to the end. What I did at the end was basically, I went through and picked out the best properties. As you can see on the screen, the area, if it was a one, it's horrible rental area. You don't want no ones. Don't waste your money there. A two, meaning it was below average. Three, that meaning it was average. Four, it was a little above average for that area. Five mean it was in a great area. 
So it kind of depends on how much money you have. That determines exactly what area you're kind of interested in because you can have, let's say $10,000 that you're willing to spend on tax properties. At that point, you want to look for the above average and average houses. You don't want to settle for the below average. So kind of determine what your end goal is always and whatever you do, what's your strategy, what's your end game? That determines what areas you look for in the properties. When I was looking for properties, I was basically looking for everything under $5,000. I was not trying to pay more than $5,000 for a property, a tax property anyway. So everything on my list was under $5,000. That's my cutoff. My grading system for the property. Uh, if it was one, that mean it was just land. That mean it wasn't no house there. That somebody had and I took the house off. Oh, well. I know I ain't want no land. Or the house was halfway there. That was a no-go, too. <laughs> hey, Eddie. Um, if it was a two, for me, the most, when you're doing a rehab, the most important things are plumbing, electrical, and roofing. And that's to me. That's where the money is going to be spent. That's where you can save money by finding a property that has those things in place. So if it was two, that means it was missing plumbing, electrical, and the roof was suspect. And if it was those three, it really was a no. Unless I had a five in the area and it was a two in the property, then I would take a better look at it. But it, it the, the grading system works together. If it was a three, I mean, the roof looks good. Plumbing or electrical is missing, but the roof is good. The roof is usually your biggest expense in a tax property because they've been sitting vacant for a long time. Four, that means all the major parts were there. It just needed paint and flooring. Five, it was moving and ready. And believe it or not, you see some that are moving and ready that are tax D. But I don't necessarily get excited about them because that means either somebody's working on it or somebody's coming back for it. Right. Um Having a grading system is very important. You need to make sure that you have something because if you're going out and you're looking for 50 properties or looking at 100 properties at a time, you can easily forget the good ones. So make sure you have a grading system. And if you're out of state and you're looking for tax properties in another state, you can do Google Maps where you can zoom in, kind of find out exactly, like you can see the date for the satellite view check the satellite view and see when that snapshot was taken. Um, and if you know any realtors in that area, see if you can have some realtors to go take a sneak peek. If you got contractors, if you start narrowing down and say, hey, I wanna look at these 10, send some contractors to, send, to um, get some pictures for you and tell you what they think. They can't necessarily go in the house all the time because they're boarded up, but they can look through the um, windows. The door may be open, maybe um where they can walk through but just make sure there's a grading system and you're very careful because that's a lot of properties at one time out of all the properties i've seen i've seen probably about 500 houses in a week's big and we only bought two so it's not easy it's going to be some work but it's well worth it. and i would say we didn't just pick two we probably bid it on about 60 of them. Yeah. And the two that we picked out of the 60 were the best of the 60. Once you view your list, and you narrow down exactly what properties were the best, make sure you're highlighting them daily. So if you're looking at 25 properties one day, go back at the end of the day, check your grading system and highlight what's my top five from these 25. So that way you can remember them, put your notes in. If it was anything about them that maybe piqued your interest. I know we have a set of properties where it was one owner he had about, was it five properties five around the same area? Um, and they all had delinquent taxes. So like that was key to remember, hey, this owner may be doing bad where we may can get this tax property if we negotiate or 
maybe he's going to come back and get it because he has five other properties. Um, once you finish driving for dollars, look at all of your top properties and make a decision and make a decision on which ones you want to put offers in. For the state of Alabama, they will let you put up to 20 offers at one time. Um, without purchasing. Without purchasing them. And it's basically you're putting in the offer to see if someone else has just paid it in the process to see if it's still available or if you can get it. You can do 20 at one time. So 20, 20, that's 40, okay? Get marked properties. 20 more, got it? <laughs> Any other business name you have, 20 more. So be creative about it. That way you can get the most out of your properties, um, the most out of your selection of properties. Once your request, um, once you put the request in and the purchases are submitted, the requests are submitted for purchase, be patient. It took about two months. Two months to hear back. To hear back. So even though we put 60 in at one time, we were probably getting one one week, 20 another week, five one week. And this was probably for a six month span, we were getting properties. Um, so be patient, be patient, be patient. Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you check the properties before you even send in your money for it to see if it's an out-of-state investor, if it's owner-occupant, are there tenants in it, what's going on before you make that decision. Check to see if there are any liens on the property. Um, that's very important. Um. One reason it takes so long because if somebody else put in to buy that property, you have to wait till their 20 days is up. Once you receive a quote back from the state to purchase, you have 20 days to give them money. If you don't get the money in 20 days, that quote isn't any good. And it goes to the next person that requested the purchase. So sometimes you just got to know the ones you want. And when they come back, you got to be ready to act on it. That's right. Preservation improvements. Um, this is a big topic when you're talking about tax properties. Preservation improvements are anything that keeps the property from going bad. Basically, if the roof is leaking and you got to put a new roof on it, that's a preservation improvement. When they come back and try to redeem the property, they have to pay that. If the windows are broken and you fix the windows, those are preservation improvements. They have to pay for those things. Um, if you install a granite countertop and it was nothing wrong with the other countertop, no damages, it wasn't causing, um, it wasn't a hole in it causing leaks to go through the subfloor, they will not pay you for that. Or laminate flooring, correct. <laughs> um, anything that keeps the property up and going. They're not they're not going to repay you for doing things that get the property rent ready. It's totally separate between preserving the property and getting the property rent ready. Now, I have talked to a lawyer and I'm not a lawyer, but I did receive some advice. And basically what she told me was whatever you do, find a way to make it look or seem like preservation. Uh, if you paint the house, that's not preservation. But if you go into the wall because you suspect it was leaking and then you have to repair and paint, that can be considered preservation. Mm -hmm. So find ways around the rules. Make sure you take lots of pictures before and after pictures. Yes. That can, if someone decides that they want to redeem their property and you don't have good before pictures to prove that what you did was preserving the property, then it's possible that you won't get any credit for it. Um, make sure you're also keeping account of exactly how much money you're spending. Make sure you keep account of your receipt. Uh, what else should they keep account of? Documentation. That, that's basically a documentation. And if you are painting the house, make sure you don't scrape it. If it's an older house, make sure you paint on top of it because you don't want to get dinged for lead-based paint and maybe not 
calling it off the correct the correct way. So just be very conscious on conscious. what you're doing. Yeah, very much so. All right. So on this on this page, these are useful links. Um that can help you when it comes to tax bills. I've actually uploaded this PDF already to our website at www.denmarkpropertiesllc.com. So if you want to get it so that you can pull up these links, feel free. The first link is Fortress. That's the tax sale training that we told you about where you get the software. Taxes is, Fortress is not free. There's a monthly subscription of about $40. There's a startup fee. It's not free. So don't think that that's free. If you're interested in it, look at it, but it is going to cost you some, some dollars. Great point. So Fortress and the system that you use for breaking down and segmenting the market is called, oh, what is it called? I just said it. Research Assistant. Research Assistant. Go ahead. Uh, the tax Assessor link. That's basically where you can go in and, and double check your properties and see if the tax has been paid or see who the owners are. If you have a, there's a different strategy to where you don't have to submit your application to the state to buy the property. I know investors that are finding the tax property, but they are contacting the owners directly and asking them, can they sell them the property? A lot of wholesalers are doing that. That's the whole other story, but that's just a, another way of using tax properties. Yeah. They're negotiating so that instead of just paying off that tax lien, they get full rights to the property and not just temporary rights. Um, Eddie put, Fortress is the goat. Yeah, Fortress is the bomb. Yes. Online application. To submit your application, if you don't want to negotiate with the seller, well, the owner, you can submit it online at revenue.alabama.gov property slash land sales. And that's where you put in up to 20 at a time um, per individual or entity. En route is the app that I use in the field. Uh, it's kind of tricky. If I have more than 25 properties in one area in one day, I would use Google Ashley will basically use Google Maps first. And then from there, we'll get the fastest route of all 50. And then we'll break the 50 up in the two sets of 25. And we'll put that in in route. And in route will basically tell us how to accomplish our goal the fastest. So these next two individuals are the key when it comes to the law of tax sales and of dealing with tax property. Denise Evans is an attorney. However, she doesn't practice law in the state of Alabama, but she blogs on the state of Alabama. She's an expert when it comes to the state tax laws, what's accepted, what's not. She practices in, uh, I want to say it's Mississippi, but don't quote me. Um, but she is um, an expert that we go to from time to time. Again, she's not free. You have to pay her, but her advice and her guidance is priceless. Um, it saved us a lot of money, a lot of money. But she does have a lot of free information on her website. That is no cost. It's just knowledge and information on tax properties and how to, and redemption process. And court cases, what the turnout was, what the um, judge deemed as preservation and what he didn't. When did it happen? Great info. Gary Board is a local attorney that's in Jefferson County. And he also does great stories on tax properties. And sometimes he'll actually sell tax properties. But he's it's a good website to go to for information and knowledge. And these are basically go-tos. If you want more information, you go to these two websites and you get all the information you need reading material-wise. Agree. All right, so it's your turn. We wanna know your thoughts. We wanna know what you're working on. It doesn't have to be related to tax properties. This is our time to mentor to you guys, to 
so you can be our mentees and we can kind of lead and direct you in whatever you're doing. Um, if you're just starting, Tanya flipping, stop touching. If you're just starting, we can help you get started. Just shoot us up with questions and let's go. And once, okay, Eddie just raised his hand, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Eddie so that he can ask his question. If you don't wanna be unmuted, that's fine. Just type in your, seen. if you don't wanna be seen and unmuted. Uh-oh. You can raise your hand if you have a question like Eddie just did. Eddie, I lost you, hold on one second. All right, Eddie. <laughs> Hey, can y'all hear me? We can hear you good. Oh, yeah. All right, so I have two questions. The first one is pertaining to tax properties. So I wanted to ask, how important is it to have a strong team and contractors in place before you're tackling these tax properties? I wanted to see uh, what are y'all thoughts on having people in place who you can rely on when trying to take down the properties and how important is it in getting it turned and rent ready? Uh, it's very important. Anytime you get ready to do a rehab, whether it's a tax property, a flip property, a rent property, you want to have some people you trust contractor-wise in your corner. You want to be able to call them and ask them questions and get estimates on the property. With tax properties, it's a little difficult because you don't have just free access to most of them. you got to kind of use your imagination and, and hope for the best sometimes. That, sorry, that was Lee just, <laughs> that was Lee just messing me just out. <laughs> okay, but the second question was uh, about, okay, I have a rehab going on right now, just a quick rental rehab, and it's kind of falling behind schedule. Now, now I know y'all done did a lot of flips, a lot of rehabs. Now, I need, I need y'all uh, advice on how do you tackle, you know, dealing with contractors who kind of falling behind schedule. Uh, what are some things that you, that you guys do to just keep control of the project? Before Antonio answers that, I just have to say this. I think forever we're going to have an issue when it comes to contractors. Yeah. I know if they have a different mindset, but it's like once the project is almost finished, sometimes it's like a go on to the next property. Mm -hmm. new money. So you got to kind of motivate them, find different ways to motivate them. Sometimes money motivates a bonus, tell them about the bonus ahead of time, so that way they can kind of say, hey, let me get that extra money and not quit right before it's done and go to the next big project. Mm. My best advice, expect it. Expect it. Plan for it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's going to happen. Yeah. It, it's just going to happen. Um. It's not going to go as you think. It's not going to go smooth. It's going to go behind schedule. So if it's going to go behind schedule, plan for the schedule. Now, I don't tell your contractor that, but the project we got going now, hey, we said six weeks. But to us, we said eight weeks. We understand project. And right now, we're at like six and a half, seven. So to them, it gives us power to say, hey, Let's get going. We behind schedule. We need to tighten up. But to us, it's like, okay, we already budgeted for it. We expected it. No pressure. It only becomes an issue when it's unexpected. So put extra in your budget for repairs because something is going to come up that you didn't plan for. Put extra time in your project, project your for timeline. miscellaneous. It's just going to happen. Now, do y'all, like, when y'all falling behind on the projects, do y'all call them up and be like, hey, uh, contractor, you're falling behind now, what's going on? Or do you just let it ride and just pray that they just get ironed out? Like, how do you communicate with them when they fall behind? You got... Constant communication. Bingo. I was going to say, you have to ask the right questions. Um, we're not overly aggressive individuals. That's not our nature. Wait. I am, Antonio's not, so I don't go. Okay. She don't handle the rehab. <laughs> so, deal with me. But for me, it's more so of asking the right questions so that they understand time is of the essence. 
Hey, I got something going on. Hey, we're supposed to do this. Hey, we're behind here. And hearing a plan from them to catch up, or what's the plan moving forward to stay on track? Yeah. Gotcha. Good question. Yeah, that, that was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Eddie, for the time. Eddie, we see you moved into your new spot. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who don't know, Eddie's one of our mentees, and Eddie actually moved into his his first property that he purchased. He purchased a duplex. He's renting out one end, and he's living in the other. So he purchased it in March, the 1st of March, and he finally is living in it. <laughs> we have a question. From Lee, from Mike Lee, Lee, not Devante Lee. Do you have any tax properties outside of the state? Great no. Question. Currently, we have two tax properties. That's all that we really want at the moment. We're going to build that side up in the near future. But like I said on the other videos, we're focusing on lease purchase hard, and that's our focus, that's our strategy. And we're not trying to detour from what we're doing until we build that system till it can run on its own. And that's a whole nother story. You don't want to do too many things um, where you're dipping where you're dipping in different pots. You want to be able to create systems so that your business can run without you. But we'll talk about that too one day. Talk to me, you guys. I see somebody hand. Mm -hmm. Ashley, I'm going to try to unmute you and, let's, and let you go ahead and ask your question. Give me a second. Ashley, are you there? Hello? Hey. Okay. Hey, Ash. I don't know if you can see me here. I can't. It's not working. Um, so what is kind of like the way that you guys have... Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. It's breaking up a little. Maybe not. Hello? Yeah. We hear you. Okay. Um, okay. What is the way that you guys went about purchasing tax properties? Was it from an auction or um, I guess maybe courthouse or what was the way that you went about purchasing tax properties or even inquiring about them? We mainly used the tax city to break it down on Fortress using the research assistant. Once we broke that down, we drove by the properties did the grading scale, and then we purchased it using the site that's online where you can put in 20 bids. So it wasn't necessarily by auction. It was just submitting online application form. Did that answer your question? You look confused. I just stuck. I think it's stuck. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We have a technical difficulty, Ashley. Let us know when you come back. Raise your hand when you come back. Mike Lee, is the property legally mined the day of sale? No. Well, you can take possession of the property. No. It's, that's, a that's a great question. <laughs> let me, let me kind of tell you the intricate parts of it. A tax deed won't be at an auction. The tax deeds are only requested through the online application. So on the day of sale, they're only selling tax certificates, which means you have no right to possession of the property at in most time. cases. Now, when you get the tax deed back from the state, 
you have the right to possession. But if there's anybody living in it, you have to evict them. Or if it's vacant, it's still good to put some type of notice on the door saying that you're taking possession and if anybody's staying here, let you know. Devante, I'm going to come to you. I see Deja raised her hand. Deja, I'm going to try to unmute you and then I'll go to Devante. Deja, are you there? Deja, raise your hand when you come back. Eddie put the website. What well, which website, Eddie? Um, I was just saying, I think Ashley was asking where I correct me if I'm wrong. I think she was asking where to purchase the tax deeds from, but I, I think y'all put the link for the, the site to where you put in the application. Now, I could be wrong. I don't know. Bingo, that's bingo. I think that was she was asking too. Okay. Download the PDF. presentation from our website and go to the online application. That, that, that website is in there. Yeah. yeah, that's all I had. All right. Appreciate it, Eddie. Thanks, Eddie. Devante has a question. Devante, I'm coming for you. I'm unmuted. Yes, it's you're unmuted, time. but before you go, let me say something. What up? I just want to tell everybody that Devante has purchased a tax property through this process. He he was he's one of our mentees. He came to the office eager and ready to learn. And the same things that we showed you tonight. He put it to the test. He bought the Ford. <laughs> he drove to the property. He's actually a investor. He has a tax property. He has it rented. And he cheesing like all I do. Dude, stop it. Stop it. All right. Now, ask your question, Mr. Lee. All right. So, my question is what's the best way to gauge on if the electrical and plumbing is still attached to the house when looking for your tax property? Good job. Let me tell you how I gauge it. First thing I do is look and see if the AC is there. If the AC is there, I assume that the electrical and or plumbing is there. Now, this is another subject, but in my tax properties, I don't put ACs back. So AC, if it's there or not, is not important to me. But if it's there, it's just a plus. But that's how I gauge. Now, if there's a crawl space and I like the house, I put my head under them and look around a little bit. But if you look through the doors and you see holes in the wall, plumbing or electrical, or plumbing and electrical is gone. Another question for you, go. What uh, what kind of would you consider would be the best use for a tax property? The best use, in our opinion, for a tax property is rental, long term, mm -hmm. because the person when you when a, when you buy a tax deed. That person still has three years to come back and redeem that property. Mm -hmm. Now, they, do they have to pay you for what you pay? Yes. Do they have to pay you for the preservation improvements? Yes. If they were preservation improvements. If they were preservation improvements. But they don't have to pay you for everything you put into it. So I say it's more of a long-term strategy. And once it becomes a free and clear property, and their redemption period is over, now you can go and do whatever you want to do with the property. So it's more of a long-term strategy than a short-term short strategy just because you don't want to put too much money into it and don't recoup the benefits. Would you ever fix and flip uh, after your redemption period is over? Yeah, yes. And, and let me kind of, you hit on something, I'm going to go a little off board. The reason you have to wait to after three years for the ta of the possession of the tax deed is because at that point you can get title insurance. You can't get title insurance as long as they have a redemption available to them. So if you want to sell it on the open market, 
most people won't buy it without title insurance. So that's why you have to wait after three years to fix and flip your sale. Gotcha. Appreciate you for answering my question. Hey, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, bye. Deja, I'm going to go back to you. Okay, we'll just read your question. How do you know when a property had a good, has a good foundation, good plumbing system, things that can't be seen from the outside? Go ahead. No, that's it. That was the question. Okay. Read again. How do you know when a property has a good foundation, good plumbing system, things that can't be seen from the outside? You can most of the time see the foundation from the outside, you would look for cracks, cracks from the bottom, cracks that have been patched up. And if you see they're separating again, that means there was a foundation issue. I typically find cracks by windows. That's usually a good area for foundation cracks. Um, sometimes if it's brick, sometimes the bricks will either shift in or shift outward. So if you see a shift, that means there are bad foundation issues. Um, Walls in the inside of the house, if you see cracks mm -hmm. in the corners, mm -hmm. that's typically foundation issues. Um, what else? Plumbing, the plumbing system, you won't know until you purchase it. Uh, unless you go up under the house and look unless or you have go up someone under. to. Now, the two properties that we bought, both of neither one of them was accessible, but I did get in them. Now, one of them did have plumbing issues with the drainage. And I had to replace a section of the sewer line. But a part of that is finding the right properties. But I knew that it didn't need that much work in the other areas. And if something went wrong, I had enough in my budget to take care of it. Did I answer your question, Deja? Thank you for joining, Deja. Eddie has another question. Let's go to Eddie real quick. So Wanda, I saw your hand raised. We're coming to you next. So, well, okay. So real quick, um, if you wanted to flip out for that three years, <laughs> if you wanted to flip out for the three years, right? Did you have to do a quiet title? Um, or is there a way around that? Like, let's say, you know, your redemption period already passed, you own the property now, for you to flip it over to someone else, do you have to go through that quiet child process or, or could you do some type of, can you avoid it? It all, it all depends on your buyer. If you want to sell it on the open market, yes, you're going to need to do a quiet title so that you can get title insurance so that the title is marketable. But if you know another investor who want to purchase it, you could just quick claim the deed to them and not do a title, a quiet title. I have some auction properties that the original owner bought them from back tax, but he never did a quiet title, and I never did a quiet title. But I I got a quick claim deed on the property, not a special warranty deed. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense, that makes sense. Did that answer your question, Eddie? Huh? Yeah, it did, it did. Um, because my main thing, like, I looked into that quiet title thing, and isn't that a, around, like, a $3,000 thing to get it done with all the attorneys and everything? Between $1,500 and $2,500 for the quiet title. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. it is expensive to get the quiet title, but if you want to play around with some numbers, you bought a tax property for $5,000, and you fix it up for $5,000, and it's worth 50 or 60, 1500 isn't much to say, hey, I'm going to sell this property for 40000 In my case, it makes sense. Just makes go. Sense. I got you. All right, thank you. 
You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, a little quick follow up to Daisy question. So can you always tell from the outside about the foundation? You can't always tell from the outside, but 90, 85 to 90% of the properties that I've seen that has foundation issues, I can tell from the outside because it's going to show on the outside. Now, it was one property that I just seen, and it didn't, it, I seen a little bit of foundation issue, but it didn't scare me. Now, we went inside and we went into the basement, and it's like the whole house was going to fall down. I ran out of there. <laughs> so, most of the time, you can tell the outside tells you, hey, you need to look farther into this, or this might be solid. Tawanda, I'm coming to you. I saw your hand raised. Devontae Lee made a comment. She said, I always look for copper. Yes, when I look under the house for the plumbing, I look for copper. Um, if, if some of that stuff gone, most of that stuff gone. Tawanda, did you still want to... I can unmute you without the video and you can ask your question. Tawanda, can you hear us? Let me see if you wrote your question. Okay. Awesome. So one, you're gonna have to mute your audio. It's not letting me do it for you. All right, Mike Lee said, in my last one, if someone redeems his or her property, how do I get my money back? Well, they're going to have to send you a demand letter. Um, we didn't talk about that. That's a whole nother story in itself. They'll send you a demand letter through their attorney and you have 10 days to respond back to their demand letter. And as a response, and there's a certain structure, which we'll get in in another series of how you should draft your demand letter, what numbers you should put on it. Um, you're going to need to pull some comps to see what prices um, houses have sold for in the area in the last six months so that you can draft what your preservation improvements are for them to pay you back your money. You get the money that you invested as far as the taxes. They have to pay you what you pay for taxes and your um, daily percentage. Is it daily? 12% daily? Your interest. Your interest. I think it's 12%. You get 12% interest on your money. And that's only what they have to pay. It's by law they have to pay you the taxes. However, you have to figure out if what you did was preservation improvements. And there's a process that takes place. You want to talk about it real quick with the referee? Uh, it's a it's a whole if if if, if it gets this if far. you and the redeemer can't agree on terms, it's a whole nother process. It's a whole nother two hour some, uh, session. session on that. But in a nutshell, either you get your money back, you go to court, or you just give up. But you will get your money back or go to court. Most times you get your money back. You basically dictate what the number is for them to redeem. And you guys just have to agree on it. Eddie said, doesn't the state give you give you it back plus the twelve percent interest and preservation? Yes. If the state don't give it back. Right. The owner would have to pay yeah. you the taxes that you paid because otherwise the property would still be delinquent. Um and the twelve percent interest, but not necessarily the preservation if it's not agreed upon that it preserved the property. Good. <laughs> Couple more questions.
think we're getting one from Facebook. If a property does have other liens, how do I get them removed from the record? Great question. Great question. You've been doing your homework, huh? <laughs> I understand that when you buy a, a property, a tax property, you take all the liens with it. You're not exempt for any other liens. <laughs> you're, you're not exempt. So let's say it's been vacant for three years and the city been coming and cut it for three years. Those liens are, are attached to the property, which is now attached to you. That's right. So lien stay with you. Mortgage is a different, it's in a different category. If the property has a mortgage, the mortgage company has a year, I want to say, to pay for the back taxes and redeem it from you. After that year, they can't come back and say, hey, I want the prop. But them sewer liens and them tree and the cutting of grass, they ain't never going nowhere. They're gonna always be there and they're gonna always take priority. So whenever you sell the property, you gotta pay them. You gotta pay them. Right. Eddie said, ouch. And I and I do a preliminary search on the on the properties. Once once I get my selection back from the state, I do a quick look on the county records to see. Is there any liens? Are there anything going on that looks kind of funny? Medicaid, Medicare. Yeah. Just double check um, and make sure that you don't have a property that can be redeemed because of those liens. Any other questions? All right, so we're gonna tell you what we've been up to. The property right there on the left in the corner is our latest flip project that we're working on. It's 411 21st Avenue South in Glen Iris, which is near downtown Birmingham. It's expected right now to be a very hot and upcoming market. A lot of people who work at UAB, who work downtown, are trying to stay in that area in particular. Eddie put, man, I love that when I had to drive by. I'm glad you that's like it. Right. It's come a long way. Uh, that's a good property to go walk through. It's still at the end stages of the rehab, but if you're not doing nothing and you want more knowledge, go walk through, bring us back some questions or ask us why we did certain things. The property's open during the day most of the time. If it's not open, Call us. call us and we'll give you the lockbox code. But if you want to see an actual rehab going on, that's a good one to go see. Yes, Eddie, you and Lee can see it tomorrow. That's not a problem. Um, this is actually a, the latest picture of it. Um, we did copper gutters. You see the copper gutters. We put the pine straw um, around the house. We just put a new door on there. It was white. It was hideous, so we had to paint it red, our standard red. Um, the floors are getting sand down right now, right? Well, they are yep. sand down. Are, yeah. Did they put the coat on today? Uh, question mark. So depending on if they did their, their first coat um, of staining the wood in the bedrooms, determines if you guys can walk all the way through it tomorrow. Good question, Eddie and Lee. Um, because they're putting, they have to do three coats of polyurine on the floors so that we can bring back the wood. The basement's pretty much finished. We're pretty much finished. We're just waiting on the electrical permit to act right. Um, electrical contractors to act right so we can get it moving. The second one um, on the right on the right is our old property, um, it's in Pelham, it's a garden home. We actually purchased it subject to, and we are now doing two things with it. We are listing it for sale on the MLS, and we are promoting it as a lease purchase. So kind of which one shakes first is the offer that we'll go with. Um, you wanna talk about that property in detail? It's a beautiful. No, I mean. So that's what we're working on. 
Tanya, you can talk about the bottom two. Uh, the bottom two, uh, we was blessed. We bought these two prop. Well, we bought one property last week or two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. We bought the one property two weeks ago. The one that's on the right. The one that's on the right two weeks ago. We bought that property subject to uh, financing. We took over the payments. We came in. We did a little work. It's in Calera, Alabama, which is a good area, good school systems, quiet. The property is only like 10 years old. Uh, and once we bought that property, her dad asked us, could we do the same thing with his property? The owner's dad. Which is exactly next door. And we should be closing on that property. Tomorrow. We're actually doing a virtual closing. Tomorrow. Well, we're doing a virtual closing. Um, he received his docs around about 5 p.m. today. He has to go sign them, get them notarized, and overnight them to our attorney office. So we'll officially sign it on Monday. But his signature will be for um, tomorrow. And we are going to lease purchase one of these properties. And we moved into one property. We, we're creating that system of lease purchase. That's kind of our main focus right now. And both of these properties fit. There's some equity in them. There's some good rental income in them. And we look to make a couple of dollars off of them. Um, I didn't put this property up and I just remembered. We have another property that we purchased that's sitting in the wing right now. And we should be starting on that in about two weeks. It's in South of Roebuck. Um, that'll be a complete rehab like 411. The other three properties are pretty much quick paint, cleaning, and go. We've actually listed the one that's in Pelham, the one, the top one at the right. Yesterday, it probably hit the MLS about 6.30 yesterday, and we've had four scheduled showings um, since then. We probably had some more that I haven't attended to. But we did it uh, flat, flat fee, fee and not with an agent. So, and it's a 3% uh, agent commission for it is what we set it up for. So, it's been doing pretty good. Flat fees like two, 100 bucks to, to list on the MLS so that everybody can. 125 to be exact. 125 to be exact. And we listed it. And a lot of times people do it to save money but we like to do it to build relationships with people and it saves money also, but we are trying to build something. So talking to agents and talking to potential homeowners are vital to us building our company. Yep, I think that's it. Like always, thank you for watching our Next thank Level you, series. You, you. We will see you in two weeks on August 10th, 2017. Same time, same place. If you guys have any questions, be sure to email us at D as in dog, P as in Paul, homebuyer at gmail.com. It's on the slide if you forget. Check out our website, www.denmarkpropertiesllc.com. Go to webinar and go ahead and download the PDF if you need it. Our child is going crazy in the other room. All right, quick. I got to, if you're still there, if you can go, it's over. You can go if you want, but a quick survey. We're basically debating on what's our next topic next week. We had a request to basically do a walkthrough of a property and go over rehabs and budgeting for rehabs and things to look for. And we also had a request to go over our marketing and, and what are we doing to find our properties and sell our properties. So if you want to do, I want to do a quick survey and just type in marketing or rehab, marketing or rehab for next week. And yes, you can ask one more question. Okay. Do I need to keep it together? Eddie vote rehab. Eddie, while everybody's voting, I'm going to go ahead and get your question. It was, it was about that um the last deal that y'all were explaining what y'all are doing when y'all decided to do a flat fee instead of listening with an agent uh, could you just uh, do a, a quick refresh on, on what that is i didn't understand i didn't realize that you could listen to mls without an agent so y'all actually put it on the mls y'all just have to pay 125 to get it on there 
we use a company called flatfee.com. Um, they're based out of Florida, if I'm not mistaken. They don't post for all um, states. I know for sure they do Alabama and Florida on their website, but you can pay them to post. Hold on, hold on. We got a bunch of alert. That, that hour last time. He, he timed. It's only an hour. Over an hour, he coming, baby. That boy good like that. Say hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. They can't see you, baby. Come on, guys. Come on. Let's go. Come on. So, basically, no, you can listen to this one. Basically, you pay them $125 and you can get up. They have a $99 package too, but the $125 package gives you up to 12 pictures that you can post for your video. If you want more pictures, that fee is a little bit higher. Um, and basically, you put your information in, you write your description, you put in the price that you want to give on commission. You can put zero, but Honestly, what agent will send the buyer your way if you have a zero percent commission? Um, so you want to be fair and give them as much commission as you you know as, as you can afford for the property. And it also be time to I like to market the property on my own because I find it more useful. Some agents don't market. I like to market heavy, and if they have multiple properties, they're probably not going to market the way I will. So, and that gives me a chance to talk to the agents, build that rapport, find out if they have any buyers that maybe don't qualify today, Come over, um, that don't qualify today, but may qualify in the future. Just building that rapport. Stop, silly girl. What's the name of the site one more time? Flat, F-L-A-T, F-E-E, dot com. Gotcha. Now, I have had an agent to say that sometimes they won't show your property if they see that it's with flat fee because they feel like you're um, blocking them out of the sale. But if you're marketing your property to the buyers and the buyers tell their agent they want that property and they want to see it, then you really can't stop at that point. Gotcha. All right. Thank you all so much. You're no welcome. problem. Glad we can help. We had three votes for rehab. Three? I only got it two. Oh, Danielle Barker. Really? The question was, the next week, do you want our topic to be rehabbing or marketing? But we had another rehab we got from rehab. there. We got a rehab. All the kids out. All right. You can stay in right now, baby. We, it's over. Marketing. <laughs> Stand up marketing. <laughs> so Mike Lee is our social media marketer. Um, so thanks, Mike. 